Hi, I'm Dave Ingebretson. Leroy Hyatt and I would like to welcome you to another edition of Fly Tying the Angler's Art. Tonight's show is going to be a little different, I guess, Leroy, rather than do uh, three different for me, <laughs> rather than doing three <laughs> patterns. We're going to spend some time talking about how to tie bass bugs and poppers and panfish poppers, uh, things, warm water bugs, mm -hmm. and then we're going to finish up with a fly, the uh, CDC Blueing the Olive Nymph. Floating nymph. Floating nymph. Right. Yeah. You know, um, many of you probably saw the show where Dave Whitlock tied a bass bug for us and a beautiful job on this clipped mm -hmm. deer hair bug. Yes. And uh, clipped deer hair bugs are fun to tie. They're very, very effective. But there's also another type of bug, as most of you know. And these are the hard bodied bugs mm -hmm. tied out of either cork or balsa wood or preformed hard bodies or preformed uh, foam soft bodies. And that's what we'd like to talk about tonight. Uh, not everybody is comfortable tying a beautiful hair bug like that. <laughs> and these others offer a wide variety of uh, exceptions to that and alternatives now, to that. Dave, you've fished these more than I have. Oh, I've fished them a lot, Okay, yeah. do you find that the hard body will pop louder in the water as oh, yeah. the hair body? Oh, yeah. Really? Oh, yeah, they'll give you a real glub sound. Oh, really? Okay. You know, when I started fly fishing, uh, I wasn't within casting distance of, uh, distance of a trout for the first two years I fly fished. So you did and nothing but I bass? I did nothing but bass and panfish oh, really? and great way to start because mm -hmm. it, it taught you how to handle the fish and how to handle the flies. And sure. uh, So for me, I'm kind of getting back into it these last few years. Uh, I've found that I would much rather, I've located some smallmouth and largemouth bass, some bluegills up here in North Idaho. Well, then and I'll have to follow you around. I'm, well, you'll have to do that because I'm finding <laughs> that you can only catch so many 8-inch stock trout out of a reservoir <laughs> before you want to do something else. And if you can go out and get a 3-pound smallmouth, mm -hmm. uh, which I am doing fairly often, okay. uh, at the risk of tipping my hand. All right. Uh, so I've kind of gotten back into, at certain times of the year at any rate, doing the warm water fishing mm -hmm. rather than the cold water fishing until our trout streams and that uh, come along. Some of our better lakes shape up. Now, uh, you can use materials that you can order or that you can buy in even a craft shop to make these things. The basis, of course, for any fly is the hook. Sure. And the standard hook for tying these, these bass bugs and poppers is a, a bass bug or a popper hook. Mm -hmm. And you'll notice that it has a bent shank. So the body won't so rotate. That's so the body won't sure. twist. Now, sure. I only know of a couple of manufacturers of these, uh, the Eagle Claw L200s and, uh, and uh, Mustad. Mustad, I don't even know the number, uh, make bent shanked hooks, and there may be other ones out there. Mm -hmm. But if you can't locate the bent shanked hooks, you can go ahead and modify a straight shanked hook. Uh, sometimes, and we'll talk about that later, you don't even have to modify the straight shanked hook. But what I've done here is I've tried to increase the cross section of the hook to keep the bug from rotating. Mm -hmm. And all I've done is I've taken like uh, 21 thousandths monofilament oh. and I've wrapped it a little piece of it on top and on the bottom of the hook shank, covered it over with tying thread, and then hit it with the quick drying cement. Okay. And so now we have an oval cross section. Sure. And it will give more body for the cork to stick to. And so it gives more glue sure. surface and it prevents rotation sure. of, the, of the bug. Now, you can buy, as, as I've got here, whoops, you can buy preformed popper bodies. Mm -hmm. This is a tiny one for bluegills, and you oh, use sure. it on a number, maybe a number 12 hook. Now you say this is preformed. What's it made out of? Well, it's made out of a hard foam. Oh, okay. uh, you can also get some of them out of a soft compressible foam Okay. for some of the bigger ones. These happen to be the hard kind. Uh, they come in up to great big sizes for saltwater poppers. These are some of the smaller versions but here. But they are preformed. But they're preformed scooped out in front so mm -hmm. they'll pop, mm -hmm. and they also have a, a slice in them to go over the For hook. The hook. Sure. Now, th they may or may not fit the hook. You may have to widen that a little bit. You can just take a little saw blade and widen it if you have to. Like or a hacksaw blade? blade? Hacksaw blade, okay. or a little hobby knife mm -hmm. of that sort, uh, or hobby saw. If you can't get those, don't want to get those, you can run down to your local hobby shop or craft shop and just buy plain old corks. Oh, sure. Or okay. pieces of balsa wood. And so I've got examples here out of how to make cork bodies, poppers, and balsa body poppers. Mm -hmm. And as you can see, these are just, just plain old corks. And just like and you put in a bottle. I bought those at a local craft shop. Okay. And again, they're available in any size you want to do. 
So the first thing we have to do with those is cut a slice in them, and I mm -hmm. use a little piece of hacksaw blade mm -hmm. and just make a slice down each one of them. Did you go halfway through? No, it depends on where I want the body to sit. Oh, I see. Usually I want the body to be Up a little higher. high on the hook. Sure. And I might say when you're using hooks not designed for this, try to get a wide gapped hook oh, uh, yes. to allow more room. In fact, this yes. happens to be a rubber worm hook, mm -hmm. a rubber worm hook that has a wide gap, and mm -hmm. that's, that's what I use when I can't get the bent shanks. So now we cut a slice in there, and simply uh, I use epoxy. Now I've always used five minute epoxy, and the best popper man I know, Gene Trump, says don't use five minute epoxy, it's not as waterproof. And I didn't, oh. I've been doing this in spite of that until I heard from him, mm -hmm. and now I'll probably be using the slow drying just because Gene says so. You would think though when you put a primer over it, it would... I put a primer and a filler, and I've got to say using five minute, I haven't had any trouble. Okay. I usually lose or wear out a bug before it comes apart. Sure. But uh, I'll just say that I use five minute epoxy for now. Gene Trump says don't, said use the regular. Okay. Now, you see when you get it on the hook, the cork is pretty rough. Mm -hmm. And before you glue it on the cork, you, uh, on the hook, you can take a saw and you can slant the front. You can take a uh, grinding bit on a drill and scoop out the front. To give it different uh, sound in the water? Give it different sound in the water. Okay. You can put it on the hook with the uh, slant downward to make a dive as it mm -hmm. pops. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can shape it a variety of ways or you can shorten it. But once you get it on the hook, you'll see there's a lot of pits and imperfections mm -hmm. in the surface. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're not fussy, and I'm sure the fish wouldn't care, you can just paint <laughs> it and go. But I, I go a little farther than that. Uh, first of all, I want to fill those pits, and I also want to fill the slot where the hook went. Mm -hmm. uh, some people will say fill that slot up with glue. Uh, I don't like to do that because you invariably get little balls of epoxy that you can't sand flat because it's oh. so much harder than the cork. Yes, okay. So I like to leave a depression and then fill it. Okay. And my hobby shop has got some cork filler, uh, or hobby filler it's called. It dries very quickly. In a couple of minutes you can sand it. And it's a white paste, and you go through and just pack that into all the spaces. Hmm. And that's what's been done on this one. So that white one, it has not been primered then? No, it's, it, well, this one, this one has. It's oh, okay. done, it had two things done to it. Okay. It's had all the pits filled all right. and then sanded smooth. It is very smooth. Very smooth. And then I put a coat of, uh, again, you can buy it at a model shop, just sanding sealer. Mm -hmm. And I paint it with sanding sealer. And again, in a, two minutes, that's dry. Mm -hmm. And then I use 400 grit sandpaper and just sand. So it's perfectly smooth. The cork now looks like the preformed body. Yeah, sure it's does. It's so smooth. Sure does. Then it's just a matter of painting it any way you want. And when you looked at that sample we had out there, uh, you'd see some that were yellow and black and uh, uh, red and white. And they're the ones that I think are so cute are these that are painted like a frog. Mm -hmm. uh, you can paint them with a brush. Uh, if you paint them like a brush, you'll see that this one's got a hard line where the brush ended. Mm -hmm. But if you did some of those other ones, you don't get that line. You use model spray. Oh, I see. And you can spray them. Uh, like uh, if we can get over on this one, I can't see it too well from here. I think this one is sprayed, and you see the li the colors fade mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. And uh, like like these blue ones, you can do them in different shapes. Uh, and that's what I've done here. Uh, we can go up and look at with balsa wood. You can take balsa wood blocks. A square or a rectangular or long or short or whatever you want. Doesn't balsa come round also? Well, it comes round also. Well, most of it's square. Oh, is it? Okay. Uh, most of it's square, but you can round it very easily. Sure. But I just took a piece of quarter inch square balsa, mm -hmm. cut a slit in it, and glued it on the hook as mm -hmm. if it were a cork. Sure. Then once it was in there, I took very rough sandpaper and then finer sandpaper, sanded it to the shape I wanted. And now you're ready to And paint. then I, well, then I put the filler on okay. and the sanding sealer, and now we're ready to paint that okay. one. Huh. So using any model paint, one that works good are the acrylic paints because they're water soluble. Oh, yes. You can clean up your brush, uh, paint it the color or spray it with the spray can to get the effects you want. Mm -hmm. In the case of a frog, I'll put little black spots mm -hmm. on it. And uh, I don't think the fish Probably can see them, but they look cute you. to me. Yes, right. uh, these you can paint to look like minnows. Mm -hmm. uh, after I paint them, I always put a coat of clear gloss on top. Oh, of them. Sure. That makes them very hard and shiny. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when you paint them up, 
then you can put eyes on them. You can get little peel-off prismatic eyes to just mm -hmm. stick on them. I think one of those has those on it. Uh, you can get what I like are these little doll eyes that you put on with epoxy. And the pupils and move. The pupils move. Sure. You can get a wide range of eyes. And you ever again, paint? Just paint an eye on it? You can paint an eye on okay. there with a circle and take... Mm -hmm. A good way to do it is take the head of a nail right. and just dip it on there and then make the pupil with a little smaller nail. Right. So there's all kinds. Of, it's just your imagination mm -hmm. any way you want to go. Uh, same way with these. Uh, now all that's left to do is to give it some living action, is mm -hmm. to put some feathers on there. Mm -hmm. And again, you've got a wide range of ways uh, to do it and let your imagination run wild. Uh, you can use rubber legs. You can buy rubber skirt legs sure. so yeah. that you can get a whole bunch of legs dangling on the back. Mm -hmm. uh, you can use that in combination with feathers. Some you crystal flash. You can put a little crystal flash in there. Yeah. And uh, you're just going to finish this frog in a simple way. And oh, I see looking over at this one, uh, I don't know if the camera can see it, but I invariably, when I do frogs, I paint the mouth red inside where it pops. Yeah, sure I'll is. Put a little red in there. Well, so, I do have this frog that will go yeah. ahead and finish. All, all the thing I've done to it, I've just started my thread at the rear of the hook. We will use this, this hen uh, saddle. It's very, very soft. Mm -hmm. And all I'm going to do, I've already pulled four feathers off, and I'm going to just line them up. Uh, match the tips as best I can and these will become the kicking legs for the uh, very interesting action these will give as you strip them through the water I'm just going to put a soft loop on it so they flare outwards. so they flare yeah. outwards you know what I also do is sometimes just take a clump of green deer hair oh I bet it and would. tie a green leg out each side sure so it's got two you tie green, a knot in two, it also no, or just stick it in no I just take a small clump and bind on the off side oh, and yeah, then take okay. a small clump okay. and buy on yeah. the other side and now you got two deer hair legs. I'll put one now on my side of the of the frog body. And those are both sticking out at angles now where it will give a good kicking motion. I've also now taken two feathers off of there. I'm just going to pull the the fuzz off and tie it in. This will become just a cover up and a soft hackle at the same sure. time. And you can do that in combination with the deer hair legs. Sure could. <coughs> A little bit Excuse different wrapping this hackle all the way at the very back of a hook. Your your <laughs> uh -huh. your senses tell you you don't yeah, do it. Don't We're do doing it. it backwards than normal. I am wrapping both of these together. Well, I was till I hmm. dropped it. I usually do them separately, and so I can. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, I just grabbed it and they both came together, so I was going on and I dropped one. But you know these things are really fun to make. I I, uh, I get into it, and of course, colors are the, the thing to do is to glue a bunch of bodies sure. and do it in stages so sure. you might do six at a time mm -hmm. and uh, do six frogs or then do six whatever color you want. Mm -hmm. I now find see I haven't fish. fished for, for bass that often. This is this is all kind of new to me. Well we ought to get you out bass fishing. Well if you're talking three pound bass I'm willing to go. <laughs> How much is it worth to you? <laughs> yeah well. To go to my secret bass pond. Then I'll show you where you can catch bigger than eight inch trout. How's that? <laughs> That's trade on. You know, I've gotten into catching little panfish, little bluegills. Oh, I find uh -huh. for bluegills, yellow and black are the two oh, colors sure. they want to be about. Sure. Solid yellow, solid black. Now I've tied that soft tackle on. Now I'm just going to whip finish behind the body, just a few wraps of that. You know, and we say bluegill in, in other part of the parts of the country. They're talking about brim or shellcrackers or all sorts of different crappie, things. Crappie, the but, crappie, uh, whatever well, they want to call it. That's a different fish. Yeah. But there you can see the, the little finished frog with the legs sticking out the back. Won't put any head cement on that at all. It has a good f whip finish on it. And that's your finished frog. It has the little eyes that shake around. Kind of a neat little Isn't bug. Isn't that cute? It really is. And like Whitlock says, once they get eyes on them, then you get a person Oh, out. yes, and in right. In fact, I usually, that's the last thing I do. Uh-huh. Oh, to uh, put the eyes just on. Just put the eyes on. Okay. I have those prepared now, but... Usually, once I get to this point, now I mm -hmm. put the eyes on and... Well, this one is sprayed because you can see yeah. how the acrylic bleeds over the edge. Yeah. There isn't a sharp line there at yeah. all. Neat little frog. Yeah. You know, Leroy, we're going to go now, I think, from what we'll call the clowns of the fly fishing world, the poppers <laughs> sure. uh, and the bugs, to something a little more imitative and something mm -hmm. a very specific representation. Mm -hmm. uh, this is going to be a blue winged olive CDC floating nymph. And it's a fly that will be useful really to anglers in any part of the country. Well, anytime there's a blue wing olive starting to hatch, yeah. yes. And any olive fly, really, it should work sure, fairly well. Sure, you bet. 
Well, we'll use a feather from a blue dun. This happens to be a neck. It wouldn't matter if it was a neck or a saddle. We'll use some real pale green dubbing. Now, again, the, the color dubbing may vary from area to area, wherever you are. The rib will be a fine gold wire. And back again to this color canard feather, the mm -hmm. CDC. And for the uh, thread, we'll use a 6 aught olive thread. What size hook are you going to use? Now, I have a size uh, 16 in the vise. I've already pinched the barb on it. We'll go ahead and just dress the shank like always. Now, the, fe the feather, the uh, pattern for this fly calls for two hackle tips put together for the tail. I, I don't think that's going to make any difference one way or the other. I think this fly will be just as effective if you just pull a few fibers off. Well, it's pretty hard to work with hackle tips and it's oh, that sm small that small or even smaller. And, and I don't know with, that it's I'd going. I'd go with the hackle fibers myself. Sure. And I'll just take them, make them about the same length as the shank of the hook, just like we always do for the dry fly. Pull it through and I'm going to trim it off. Now I'm going to cover all this up with dubbing anyway, so this part that's left on the hook right here is not going to make that much difference. I'll get a fine piece of this wire off. And again, like we've said, when you cut the wire, Come up, cut at the very back of your scissors. Save those tips for when you're trying to cut the fine material. I'll tie this wire in place. Take a few wraps, and I'm going to put it in my spring. Hope it'll stay there. Then we'll use a little bit of this green dubbing. You know, that's something we might suggest to people. They, if you're not currently using some kind of a material clip or material holder, uh -huh. just a small spring wrapped around the barrel of your... Uh, your vise uh, can hold a variety of things back out of the way, and it's pretty it's handy to have. Just a third hand is really what oh, it yeah. is. Now, again, like we've said in, in other shows, you want to keep this dubbing very fine, very fine on the thread. It lets you control it better. You can get a taper. Now, I'm definitely am not going to have enough here. I want to take a wrap of dubbing behind my rib. That way that rib's not going to fall off the end of the of the fly after it's all done. And I'm just going to start coming forward. I'm starting to build a little taper here. And come up about to the thorax area. Now I'm going to stop right there and tie in a CDC feather. And what I'm going to do, it's going to be a, a different kind of a hump, a, a wing case on there. I'm going to just strip this fiber down toward the tip till I get down right to the tip. So you'll be folding this over. So, uh, yes, I am. Tie it in place. Now, I know that's going to be a little bit too... Oh, I tied it in wrong, Dave. I do have to fold it over. You said that, and then I went totally confused. You know, I'm curious what the advantage of the CDC is if you're going to fold it over instead of having free well, fibers anyway. As soon as you see what we're going to do with it, I, I huh. know you'll know what, what we're talking okay. about. Now it's all folded in right, tied in right. Then I'm going to tie in just a little bit more dubbing for this thorax area. Got a piece stringing off here. And I'm going to keep going with that same taper toward the front. I've left myself room here. Now I'm going to run the rib forward. And I'm going to wrap this rib counter wrap or counter as we've been saying in the past, so it will not fall through all the dubbing that's on there. It'll, it'll see it, you can see it through the dubbing a little easier, mm -hmm. it stays on top. I'm going to so come you're gonna right put on that up right through the thorax, and too. Go through the thorax. Well, that's unusual. There aren't the a lot of flies that carry the rib through the thorax. Mm -hmm. Well, again, it's, uh, you could stop at the thorax if you wanted, but I've already gone on past, so I need to just keep going with it this direction. Now I'm going to fold this wing case over and tie it down, but I'm not going to tie it real tight here yet. I'm going to take my vodkin, stick it in, and just raise it up. What I'm doing is just making oh, yeah. a, a little hump there with that, and you can see what that's going to do, how that's mm, going to that's trap a, air. Well, that's basically then we're talking about is like a looped wing emerger. Yes, it is. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that that looped wing emerger was... Uh, uh, developed way back in the early 70s by the late uh, John Goplin.
Oh, really? He was a young guy from uh, St. Paul, Minnesota. I got to know him in the club there. And as far as I know, he tied the first looped ring emergers. Hmm. And I but forget. he tied two of them, didn't he? One or two loops, as I recall. Well, not his original one. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. And uh, I forget what medical condition he had. He had a very untimely early death. Huh. And uh, up when he was getting quite sick, they'd put him in a wagon and, and pull him down to the edge of Armstrong Spring Creek. Oh, uh, that was okay. before you had to pay to fish there. Wow. Or they would set him in a canoe and, uh, and then lift him out again. And he fished right up to the end. Uh, oh, but he wow. died at a very premature early age, and it really pleases me to see uh, his looped wing emergers have become quite popular. Well, that, now. That's, a, that's a neat fly. Huh? Although people don't realize who it was. That, uh -huh. As far as I know, he was the first to tie any kind of looped wing emerger. Well, I think that would really catch, catch uh, a lot of air. I think it would uh, accept floating very well, plus that CDC is going to let it float anyway. Oh, sure. Help it float. Yeah. Put a little drop of cement on it. I just filled the eye. I'll run that bodkin through there and take it out. Oh, I like that pattern. It's a good looking pattern. It really is. I have not used this pattern, but I'm not a doubt in my mind it will work. And that's the, the Blue Wing Olive CDC Floating Nymph. Use a tail of blue dun. Use a pale green or a fine green dubbing. It's ribbed with gold wire. It has the folded wing of color canard or CDC. Well, that's it for today, Leroy. We've tied a bunch of bass bugs and poppers, and we tied the blue winged olive CDC floating nymph. Uh, quite a combination, I it guess. It sure is. <laughs> <laughs> but weren't those bass bugs kind of fun? Oh, they were. They're pretty little things. Yeah. I, I'd never fooled with them that much. Well, maybe we had, in what time we've got left, we ought to talk about how to fish those things a little okay. bit. Yeah. Uh, if people haven't done it, you know, they talk about them as being poppers, mm -hmm. and I think sometimes people get carried away and make them pop too much. Uh, what I generally do, whether I'm fishing for bass or panfish, is I let the thing hit the water and then sit there. And you hope that the plop of hitting the water has attracted well, the fish's right. attention, they're looking at it, sure. and then maybe those legs move a little bit, the rubber legs move if you've got rubber legs on them. Mm -hmm. And don't make a real violent pop, but I try to gently move them at first. Make a little disturbance in the water and then let it sit some more. Let them sit some more. And especially with panfish, the, mm -hmm. the brim or the bluegills, they often hit it when it's dead still. Do you have to have a, a special rod, a heavier rod, no, a, a you heavier need to, leader? You need to cast a little bit heavier leader to turn okay. them over. Uh, if you're fishing bass bugs, yes. I like a bass bug line, which is an extreme oh, weight forward okay. taper to help get the weight out and turn that bug over. Because I know fishing large steelhead flies, like hair flies, you do need that. Yeah. Well, I use, I use a bass bug taper line, but not on the little panfish okay. ones. There I just okay. use a regular weight forward, five or six or okay. four. But uh, for the big bass bugs, yes, a heavier bass bug special okay. line. That makes sense. But don't pop them too much. Now, if those things aren't working, and if I'm exploring along the edges of weed beds and lily pads, mm -hmm. then I might give them a pretty good plunk and then go gloop and let it sit, and then wiggle a little bit, and then a bloop, and experiment. Mm -hmm. But don't just strip them out and go plop, 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 plop. That's usually the last yeah. effort. You know you're right with that, because in fishing hoppers, uh -huh. what's the first thing you do? Splat. Let it hit the water. Let it, let it sit. That, like it's stunned. Sure, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, I've been having more fun fishing those brim with oh, these little man, things, I... and just a light rod, and let it sit there, and oh, man. And what you do is you go along in your float tube for your boat, mm -hmm. casting in along the weed beds, and once you catch cast one, in tight, you mean? cast in very six inches mm -hmm. maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, once you find them, stay there and fish. You might catch 20 fish out of a 10 foot square place. So they're not moving then like No, trout they're schooled and... up. Oh. And so you move and you find them and then you go okay. some more. Smallmouth okay. bass is a little different. You're fishing in the typical cover. But the main thing is experiment, and don't think because they're called popping bugs, you got to pop them all the time. all the time. And you yeah. might have these little tapered minnows that you slide in. So experiment around. Go out and have a good time with bass and Different panfish and bluegill, sure. and uh, just have a great time. Dave and Leroy have produced two 90-minute videos covering new and exciting tips on how to make your fly tying better and more effective. They introduce you to everything you need as a beginner and demonstrate helpful techniques for intermediate tires. Fly Tying Techniques Volumes 1 and 2 are available by calling 1-800-883-0124. Cost of each video is $28.95 plus shipping and handling, or get the two-volume set for just $52.95. 
You can also order the programs in this series. Each 90-minute videotape includes three programs for just $22.95, plus shipping and handling. To order Fly Tying, the Angler's Art Videos and Techniques tapes, call 1-800-883-0124.